Brigadier General Charles McGee first joined the United States Army Air Corps in 1942, eventually becoming a member of the 332nd Fighter Group, one of two segregated Air Corps groups known as the Tuskegee Airmen. McGee flew as a fighter pilot in Europe during World War II. The 332nd Fighter Group's role was to support strategic bombing of enemy targets all across Europe. Some youngsters often ask, well, were you scared? I say, if you're scared, you're in the wrong business. Now retired, the 100-year-old's legacy continues as having one of the longest active duty military careers and highest combat totals. Join us as we look at the European theater during World War II and how you can play a role in preserving the incredible stories of veterans like Charles McGee. is an amazing individual. We'll be hearing more from him later in the show. Here at the Smithsonian Stephen F. Udvar Hazy Center, we have a world-class collection of World War II airplanes. You'll be seeing several of them today. Like the Sikorsky JRS-1 you see behind us. This amphibious seaplane is the only aircraft in the museum that was at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii on December 7, 1941, when the Japanese attacked launching the United States into World War II. The Navy immediately sent these unarmed utility craft to search for the enemy fleet. Oh, but this type of airplane doesn't have any guns. The airplane you see in the museum is the only remaining example of this type of airplane in the world. We know that you may not make it to the museum here in Chantilly, Virginia, but I bet there's a library, museum, or an archive in your community with its own World War II connection. World War II mobilized the entire country and you never can tell what connection your community has to the war. I bet you you have a connection right in your own backyard. One museum that has a great local connection is the National World War II Museum in New Orleans, Louisiana. It started as the D-Day Museum because of the Higgins boats. Vital to D-Day were designed, tested, and built in New Orleans. Let's head down to the National World War II Museum. New Orleans, Louisiana, the Big Easy. Home to jazz, river boats, great southern cooking, and the National World War II Museum. That's where you can learn all about the story of the American experience in the war that changed the world, why it was fought, how it was won, and what it means today so that all generations will understand the price of freedom and be inspired by what they learn. Offering a compelling blend of sweeping narrative and poignant personal detail, the National World War II Museum features immersive exhibits, multimedia experiences, and an expansive collection of artifacts and first-person oral history, taking visitors inside the story of the war that changed the world. Today we're going to learn about World War II and VE Day, or Victory in Europe, that happened 75 years ago. Today we want to tell this story in a little bit of a different way. There aren't many World War II veterans like Charles McGee left, but there are veterans all around us. And I'll bet that you actually know someone who is currently serving in the military or has served in the military. And just because someone didn't serve during World War II doesn't mean that they don't have a great story to tell. Both of our fathers served in the military. Mine was in the Navy. Mine was in the Air Force and my grandfather served during World War II. Today, we're going to take a look at how you can help tell these stories. To start, we're going to head back down to New Orleans to learn a little bit more about bombers. Hi, 
My name is Seth Paradin, historian and digital content manager here at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans, Louisiana. And I'm here with my son, Sullivan James. We're standing here in our Campaigns of Courage Pavilion in, inside Road to Berlin, our Air War Gallery, and we're here to talk about strategic bombing in World War II. So what was strategic bombing anyway? It, it was an effort employed by the American Army Air Forces to attack targets in central Germany and France. We were bombing targets in Germany and France that produced war goods, goods like oil, uh, bullets, tanks, airplanes, things like that. Because what we were trying to do eventually was weaken their military enough to where we could invade uh, continental Europe and liberate France, Belgium, Luxembourg, different countries like that. What were some of the planes used by the Allies for strategic bombing missions? Well, there were a bunch. So the American Army Air Forces particularly used this one airplane right here. Uh, they used several, but this is the main one that they used. This is the Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress. So the Boeing B-17 carried a crew of 10 men. There was a bombardier, a navigator, a pilot, a co-pilot, a top turret gunner, flight engineer, a radio operator, two waist gunners, a ball turret gunner, and a tail gunner. It's a lot of dudes in one plane. And they would fly from England across the English Channel. They'd fly into France or Germany and they would bomb the targets. It was called the Flying Fortress because it had so many guns on it. If you look at the picture, see there's tail guns, there's a waist gun, ball turret, top turret. There was a gun here in the radio operator's compartment and there were two or three guns in the nose of the bird. So what it was designed to do was defend itself from enemy fighter attacks. And of course, over Europe, this is the German Luftwaffe. These are the, this is the German Air Force. They flew ME-109s and FW-190s, among a bunch of other different kinds of planes. And what they would do is they were trying, the Germans were trying to attack the B-17s and shoot them down, because of course, in order to shoot them down, when they did shoot them down, they would not have as many aircraft over, over their targets, over their cities, and therefore not inflict as much damage. But the B-17, was an extremely rugged airplane. By rugged, I mean it was really, really tough. So this thing could take a lot of damage and it could bring their people home, not all the time, but a lot of the time. So a lot of times you look at pictures of the B-17s from the 8th Air Force and the, and the 15th Air Force in Italy, and they're chock full of holes. They're all shot full of holes. Some of them are missing pieces of the tail, pieces of the wing are missing, big old holes in the side of the airplane. And they could take that much damage and they could still bring their crew home. And the crews, the air crews and the B-17s absolutely loved their airplanes because they were fantastic and they were safe and they'd bring their guys home quite often. We had a bunch of aircraft, they're called fighter planes. Fighter planes are a lot smaller than bombers. And the fighter planes that we had were good, but they didn't have the range. They didn't, ha they didn't have the ability to fly all the way into Germany and then come all the way back home to England uh, until, early, until late 1943, early 1944 when we, the Americans, introduced this one plane into the, into the arsenal, and this is the P-51 Mustang. The P-51 Mustang is probably the most famous fighter airplane of World War II, maybe of all time, I don't know. But it was a fantastic airplane. It had this incredible range. It could fly with the bombers all the way to targets way out in eastern Germany and even in the Poland sometimes, and fly all the way back into England. And what happened, when the, when the 51s were flying with the 17s and the 24s, they were able to beat off the German Luftwaffe. They were able to keep them away from the bombers. Now that's not to say that the Germans never shot down any more bombers, because they did. They shot down a lot more. But when the P-51s were there, they were the ones that were dogfighting with the Germans in the air and, and keeping as many of the German aircraft away from the bombers as they could, which helped our people, the guys in the bombers, survive. So the P-51s and the P-47s and the P-38s, they were absolutely incredible and they were very, very vital to the war effort, especially over Europe, because it helped save a lot of lives. Back at the National Air and Space Museum, we are taking a break from World War II to show how you can interview a veteran to help tell their story. We've even brought in an expert to help us with this. Jaden Jefferson is a reporter who happens to be 12 years old. He's interviewed numerous people, regularly covers the local city council, and has even covered the presidential election. Jane, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. How did you get started in this journey of interviewing people? 
Well, I've always been a person who's loved to write, um, loved to shoot video, edit video, um, always had his head in the news. So I think that's kind of how I got my start. And I kind of, you know, turned that into what I was watching and I started just uh, doing that around and I think it was very rewarding. What's the coolest thing you've gotten to do so far? Um, coolest thing, I think I've, I've interviewed a lot of celebrities, presidential candidates, but I think my favorite, because I am a political reporter, I think I, I, it would have to be Elizabeth Warren. Nice. Jaden, we've invited you here today because we have a veteran we want you to interview. Are you ready to get to work? Yes. All right. Head on over. Alvin Drew, take one. How are you doing? Nice to meet you. Hi, I'm Alvin Drew. and Jaden Jefferson, nice to meet you. So I know you're joining us to talk about your experience in the Air Force. Yes. What were some of the planes that you did get to fly? And uh, how was that experience for you? Was it rewarding or how did that, how did that turn out for you? So it was, for me, it was very rewarding to go fly different airplanes. I started off flying helicopters and helicopters is the best way to describe it is, is like going out on a, a motocross or four-wheeling. Um, it's, it's rough, it's tumble, it's, it's, you know, you come back, you know, spattered in mud and, you know, and, and things like that, and it's that, that sense of adrenaline. Whereas if you're out in a, in a supersonic jet, like I got to go fly T-38s or F-16s, uh, you're out there planning, you know, you've got to be, say, a minute ahead of that airplane at all times, and some of that plane's going to speed of sounds, which puts you a long way out, where you're running math, okay, if I'm gonna dive, I need to pull out of this dive with this many G's by this amount of altitude or I will hit the ground. So it was a very different rewarding experience for me. Plus, you know, just the things just happen faster. You point up and you watch your earth just drop away because you're going 500 knots straight up. So I'm grateful that I got to do both of those different things and not just one of them. Your story is similar to a lot of people who said they looked up in the sky and said, I want to fly that plane. A lot of people, you know, they don't think much of it, but you did and you came out with this positive result and kind of you know, when you were uh, flying those planes, were there any, you know, fears you had, anything that was stopping you from doing that, that you overcame to be able to do it? I said the biggest issue was always just self-doubt. Like, who am I to get behind the controls of this airplane and go roaring around the sky and bring it safely back? And you'll get to that spot where you think, am I ready for this? And it helps always to have somebody there who just go give it a shot. What were some of the connections that you have that are long lasting and are you still have to this day? So when I first announced I wanted to go to the Air Force Academy, I had an aunt who had a friend who was a Tuskegee Airman and he had an airplane out in one of the fields near Washington, D.C. I remember sitting out in his, um, in his King Air airplane and he's explained to me all the different things about what it was like to be a Tuskegee Airman and flying. And so what, it wasn't just with him, but it was with this whole group of folks out there told the Tuskegee Airman who had set that path in front of us uh, where I continuously cross path with these folks out there and they were always very, very helpful up to and including uh, General Charles McGee. We're, we're still trading stories and he's still giving me useful advice. It's hard to believe I'm in my almost 60 and still getting great advice from somebody, but he's got about 40 years on me still, so there's lots to learn from him. Well, the Tuskegee Airmen made history. They were um, the black pilots that we all know today. And how did they inspire you? Because, you know, now it's, it's, it's as important as ever that we have African Americans and minorities that are taking part in these careers. So for you to be doing that, I mean, what's your outlook of that opportunity? Do you view it as, well, I'm just another person who's doing this, or I, this is an honor for you? How do you view that? Okay, so a couple of different ways. So the first thing was back when I watched the Apollo 11 crew land, um, and I asked about, should I become an astronaut? The next question that came out of my mouth was, can somebody black actually be an astronaut? This was just after the Civil Rights Act had just been passed, and so there's still segregation had not departed from our society. And my dad said, Air Force has already picked a black astronaut. Um, man, he was unfortunately killed in an aircraft accident, but it was all I needed to know. So once that barrier was down, it was on me at that point. If I didn't succeed, it was because I had failed, not because there was some barrier out there, social barrier between me and that goal. I didn't have the excuse. From their pers my perspective, what they did was socially significant. Um, Benjamin O. Davis, the first commander of the Tuskegee Airmen, said his least favorite words in the English language were first and only. And what I liked best about my job was all the things I did as a pilot and as an astronaut, none of them were first or onlys. 
Uh, it was just a regular thing. Nobody raised their eyebrows. Like, Isn't it great that you're a black pilot? No, this is it's great that you're a pilot. In one sense, the fact that nothing I'm doing is significant, I find to be of great significance to me. They, they have paved that path to where it's just, we're just accepted. And there's nothing unusual. All you have to do is have the drive and work hard and go out there and get it. There's no excuse for anybody out there to not try. Well, I think we think alike, because that's also how I like to th um, think about it, because now when you see an African-American doing things like this, your first thought is African-American. The visual intent and goal was to make it normal and mainstream, and the fact that you had not used you know, your race as an excuse for not getting things done is inspiring to me. I'm sure it's gonna be inspiring to many other people. So kind of the people that are still thinking of this as, look, I can't do this because I'm black, or they're not gonna let me, what, what do you say to them? Not only have we done it, we're still doing it. And so what's your reason for sitting back and saying you can't do it? We've been in the White House, we've been in space, uh, we've been in heads of, of Fortune 500 companies. Uh, what exactly do you think was holding those people back? You know, yes. and, and those are the same things that are holding you back, so get off your tail and go. Well, thank you so much for joining me. You bet. Well, Jaden, how'd it go? Well, I learned a lot of things. He's not just an Air Force veteran, but he was also an astronaut. Kind of cool stuff that happens here at Air and Space, isn't it? It only happens at Air and Space. <laughs> All right, well, we've got one more person we'd like you to meet. Come on. Jaden, this is Bella. She's going to do an interview with a veteran, too. Can you give her some tips? Sure. All right, you guys get to work. Well, Bella, how are you feeling about interviewing your veteran today? I'm a bit nervous. So would you be interested in learning just a few tips about that? I would love to. So you're interviewing this veteran. What's going through your mind when you're doing this? What questions will I give the veteran if I say the question wrong? Well, just a few I've collected over time. I would first say when you're interviewing someone, um, get some background knowledge ahead of time. I think it's easier to develop questions. I think if they wrote like a memoir or a book, um, you should check that out because other people, when they're interviewing, they want to talk about one specific thing. But there may be something that they missed when they were reading their story that you could bring out. What's the most surprising thing you've ever learned? So I think when you're talking to someone, um, think of them as a person because um, if you're not, you're going to think, oh wow, I'm not prepared to do this. Um, I don't know who this person is. I've never talked to someone like this. Is there anything I should bring to an interview? Before you bring the camera, you should kind of get an understanding of what, you know, what's going on, maybe chat with them ahead of time. And then that's when I'd say you could bring in a camera of sorts. And, I, and that could be a phone, that could be an iPad. Anything that records, I guess, HD video is always good. Um, a microphone is always beneficial. What do you do when the interviewee is answering your question, like with your hands, with your face? Shake your head to kind of understand that you're listening and you're understanding what they're doing. Um, smile so then they don't feel as if they're like being really like grilled or made uncomfortable. Um, I think my third thing, I guess for your hands, just I guess keep them in your lap and or do the same thing that person's doing when you're asking them a question. So make sure that your that your body language is matching the other person. I just try to listen without you know interrupting, um, you know, but whether they're taking a pause and thinking about something. Okay. And then I think another one is you always have to thank you and acknowledge them for taking time out of their day. Well, Bella, I think you're ready for your interview. Thank you so much for your help. No problem. Have a good time. Bye. Bye. Good morning, Bella. Good morning. How are you? Good. Nice to meet you. So I heard you're in the Air Force. Is there anything that if like anybody wanted to be in the Air Force that they should know about it? Yeah, um, I am in the Air Force. I'm a helicopter pilot right now stationed at Andrews Air Force Base. I've um, been here for about a year and in the Air Force for about six. I would say that if you're thinking about joining the Air Force or the military at all, it's a big decision. It's important to um, you know, put in the years that you're thinking about it, put in the time, um, because it does change your life and no matter what, you will have a commitment. So you're, you're active duty? Yes. So you still uh, pilot helicopters? Yes. What's one of your favorite ones you've piloted? Um, definitely the Huey. It's um, an old helicopter. It's been around since Vietnam. Um, and you probably see them flying around all the time, making lots of noise, but it's so much fun. Um, nothing about it is an automated aircraft. Everything is responding to the inputs I put in. What was it like the first time for you to fly a helicopter? 
very difficult. Um, it was like trying to stand up in a hammock and control it and make it be still. Uh, flying helicopters is very difficult the first time you do it, but once you get the hang of it, it's just like riding a bike. What's a role that the Huey plays in the Air Force? Um, here in the National Capital Region, we do continuity of government operations. In case anything bad happens, uh, we would be charged with getting members of the government away to a safe area. Where I was previously I was in Global Strike Command and we did a lot of nuclear security. Uh, so primarily the, the Huey is for security purposes and then we can also use it for personnel recovery for search and rescue operations. What's flying over the DC Capitol like? It's amazing. It's so much fun. There's a lot to look at. It's almost like having a scenic helicopter tour every time you fly. Um, very fortunate to be stationed here and able to fly in the National Capital Region. And especially like coming up with the cherry blossoms blooming, it's going to just be beautiful. What type of obstacles did you have to overcome? There are a lot of challenges that I've faced just in my short career in the Air Force. Everything from just getting into college to getting a pilot slot, getting through pilot training, um, all of that, none of that came easily to me. I really had to work on it. Um, and if anything, that taught me that anyone can do this. If I could do it, anyone can. Um, and then being a woman is different um, in the military, but the generation before me made it easier for me. I'm going to make it easier for you and hopefully you make it easier for my daughter so that um, one day no woman will feel out of place or mistreated or alone in any career field she wants to be in. What is something you're most likely to do after the Air Force? For me, um, I just had my first kid. I had a daughter and it's really changed the perspective I have uh, for my life. So after I get out of the Air Force, I really want to go into serving kids, women, any underprivileged community. Um, I have a big passion for that. And especially being here in DC, there's so many opportunities to get involved and volunteer and get involved in your community. Um, so I would even look into going into uh, politics after I get out of the Air Force. Thank you so much for coming. All right, Bella, how'd it go? I was very nervous at first, and then I leaned more into the interview and I got better. Nice. How important is it for you to be able to give an interview to someone like Bella? It's incredibly important. I see very much of myself in Bella and in every younger generation. Um, this is an amazing opportunity for you. There's nothing like this when I was a kid. Um, so I'm very, very proud to be a part of this with you. Bella, how much fun was this today? It was awesome. I'd be glad to do this again. Well, let's go back to General Charles McGee and hear more of his story. During World War II, uh, of course, the Army policy became from a 1925 war college study said that we didn't have the mentality and the moral ability to do anything in the technical area. We could do service things, you know, dig ditches, cook food, drive trucks, but fly an airplane, no. Because of the need, the growth, and the, given the opportunity, we dispelled those biases and generalizations that made that possible. But, but segregation existed at the time, and although we qualified with good training to perform in, in the aviation field, uh, the Army still maintained it as a segregated operation. Many of the groups did not know that the then Red Tails P-51s were black pilots. But our job there was to help save American lives, therefore stick with the bombers and only leave them if they were attacked or tent by German Folkwolf or Mr. Schmidt aircraft. Fortunately, great training and ability to believe in the instruments. I'm still here. You know, you're a speck in the sky and later grow and hopefully you recognize whether it's friendly or foe. But fortunately, in the uh, fighter aircraft, we could change our altitude, fly above, out to the side or below, whatever we best fit the circumstance and uh, had to follow the lead bomber and on the bomb run, there was no deviation even though the flak blanket from ground fire might be heavy. Um, therefore, we fighter pilots could still do our job but change our altitude, move around a, a lot more than the, than the bomber aircraft. Many didn't realize that we were black pilots, but 
realize that given the opportunity and the training and preparation, we did a good job for them that helped save American lives. Seventy-five years ago this month, the war in Europe ended. World War II was truly a global conflict involving many countries and multiple battlefields. It was complex to say the least. It had two endings. Let's learn a little bit more about what happened 75 years ago. Victory in Europe. On May 8, 1945, the Allies of World War II officially accepted Nazi Germany's unconditional surrender of its armed forces, which ended the war in Europe. Today, May 8th is celebrated as VE Day for victory in Europe. VE Day meant the end to nearly six years of a war that saw millions of lives lost, the destruction of homes, cities, and families, and which had brought on huge global suffering. Upon the defeat of Germany, celebrations exploded throughout the Western world. In Great Britain alone, more than one million people flooded the streets in celebration. In London, the King and Queen appeared on the balcony of Buckingham Palace along with Prime Minister Winston Churchill to greet the cheering crowds. In the United States, the day coincided with President Harry S. Truman's 61st birthday. I wish that Franklin D. Roosevelt had lived to see this day. Truman dedicated the victory to former President Franklin D. Roosevelt, who had died of cerebral hemorrhage a month earlier on April 12, 1945. While VE Day was a day of celebration, it was not the end of World War II. The victory in Europe was complete, but the Allies were still fighting the Pacific Theater. The war against Japan had not yet been won. Churchill told the British people, we may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing as Japan remains unsubdued. President Truman told Americans that it was a victory only half won. The victory won in the West must now be won in the East. VE Day was not the end of the conflict, nor the end of the impact the war had on people. World War II would go on until the Japanese surrendered later that year. Even then, the impact of World War II was felt long after Germany and Japan surrendered. As you've learned today, veterans tell some incredible stories. Here are some tips to help you collect your own oral histories. I'm Jane Jefferson, student reporter, and I'm here to share you some tips on how to do a great oral history or interview. An interview is not like chatting with your friends or family. An interview requires the person asking the questions to do a lot more listening and not so much talking. Here are a few simple tips to help develop your interviewer skills. Make sure your guest is comfortable. Have comfortable seating. Make sure there's water. And before you start, know how much time you have with the person you're talking with. Set up your guest to tell a good story. Avoid using questions that can be answered with a simple yes or no. And don't interrupt a good story. Start with easy questions. Save the delicate questions, if there are any, until you've gotten to know your guest better. Don't let silence fluster you. Give your guests some time to think about their answer. Just because there's a pause doesn't mean there isn't a story coming. Have questions prepared, but be ready to ask follow-ups. Then ask your questions one at a time. Don't be tempted to ask a series of questions all at once. Keep these simple tips in mind and you will become a good listener and expert interviewer in no time. Now get out there and collect those oral histories. World War II left us with a long and complicated history. We hope that you've enjoyed the stories you heard today and that you're prepared to collect your own veteran histories. Thanks for watching. United, the peace-loving nation, have demonstrated in the West that their arms are stronger by far than the might of dictators or the tyranny of military cliques that once called us soft and weak. The power of our people to defend themselves against all enemies will be proved in the Pacific War as it was proved in Europe.